So we're in the book of Philippians. We've been working through fairly quickly through the book of Philippians. Started out in chapter 1, looking how there was the, the, a gospel-centered fellowship. And that was the, the means for everything that we do. As we come to verse 2, or chapter 2, we've seen how Paul switched the situation. He took the focus off of him and his own situation to where now it is focusing on the church's situation and what's going on with the church. We've been moving pretty quickly. And I said we're going to have many sermons that are talking about unity. Because that's what Paul's really focusing on, on the unity of, of the church and how we're to be united. And last week, two weeks ago, we talked about the, the unity that was outside of the church. You know, external opposition, how we can stand united. Last week, we talked about standing united in the face of internal opposition. And this week, we're going to talk about standing united in the mind of Christ. See, so often people excuse selfishness and pride or evil by claiming, this is my right. And this, this is something that happens even within the church. Well, this is my right. I have a right to cheat on this test if you're in high school. Or if you're in just in elementary school, I have a right to get a good grade on this, and the teachers didn't teach me well. It's my right. Or I have a right to spend all this money. I earned it. I have a right. I have a right for you to hear my opinion. Talked about that last week, about taking, looking at life through other people's lenses of their glasses, asking others to see life through their eyes. So we have this idea of we have these rights and people start things out of excuses. See, how are we ever going to, to put others' interests at first when, when you do that enough for yourself? You know, I mean, we do that so often. How are we possibly, how can I put my interest, is what we should be saying, how can I put my interest first when you do that enough? See, brothers and sisters, that's the wrong mindset. See, and what our goal today is to encourage you to stand united in the mind of Christ. See, our Lord and Savior is a humble servant. And Paul goes into being, showing us many, many different aspects of what it means to be united. And he's giving us many examples. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 2, verses 1 through Five, one through four. And we're going to take our time, even though we've went through up to chapter two pretty hastily, we're going to slow way down. We're going to be a, a few weeks in verses one through, or chapter two, verses one through 11. But today we are primarily going to focus on chapters or, or, or verses one through four. So if you'll turn your Bibles, or it will be on the screen, uh, the, the TV here to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we will see that we stand united in the mind of Christ by his example, because it fulfills God's promises that are brought about through his incarnation. So if you'll read with me, starting in verse 1 of chapter 2. Hear now the word of the living God. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not to his own interest, but to the interest of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. 
Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. As far as the reading of the word of God, amen. Now, I actually did misspeak saying that we were going to be looking at 1 through 4. We're actually looking at overall 3 through 8 is where our main focus is going to be. And we're really going to be primarily focusing on standing united in the mind of Christ. See, we stand united when we strive to be the church. By following Christ's example. That's how we're united in the body of Christ. When we follow his example. And we're going to see this through two major heads. First, that we stand united in the mind of Christ because we strive to be a healthy church. And secondly, because we strive to follow Christ's example. So, notice with me in verses 5, we can see... That we stand united in the mind of Christ because we strive to be a healthy church. In verse 5, Paul says, Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now that should be blatantly clear, right? So what is he talking about? Have this mind. Well, it really points back to the following verses, which we talked about last week, which is why I read it. So this mind is to do nothing from selfish ambition, nothing from conceit, but in humility, counting others as more significant than yourself. You see, that this is where it comes into the principle, how can I put your interest first when you do that enough yourself? See, that's not the right mindset, brothers and sisters. That is not the mindset of Christ. See, what you may not see in the, in the English text, that this, this verse have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. There's a whole bunch of extra words there. In, in the original language, it, it literally says, this mind have in you, which was in Christ. See, this means you are to have the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean that it's just you can think of acting just this way. Let me say, put a, an if clause in it. If you have the mind of Christ... You will act this way. If you have the mind of Christ, you will put others first. If you have the mind of Christ, you will not work from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, you will count others more significant than yourself. See, because we strive to be a healthy church, and because a healthy church has the mind of Christ, we must strive to have this. See, we stand united in, in Christ's mind when the whole church strives for all members to be in the church. See, this is one of the things that we're going to talk about in our, in our Baptist Distinctives class. See, those who are truly in the church, who are truly members of the church, are those who are in Christ. Sure, you may come to church every Sunday. You may be involved in ministry. But the only people who are actually of the blood-bought bride of Christ are those who have the mind of Christ. The only people who have the mind of Christ are those who have repented of their sins and trusted upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Sure, you may come to church and you may say, I want to have a good feeling and I want to be a, a part of this club. But do you have the mind of Christ? Oh, brothers and sisters, this is a message that many of us in America think, it's all about me. Let me tell you about me. Put others more significant than yourself. Be united. See, because we strive to be united, we strive to be a healthy church. We also want to make sure that our membership are in the body of Christ. So often today, people want numbers. I want to have a healthy church, and we deem a healthy church by how many numbers are here. All you get then is a whole bunch of goats that are amongst the sheep. And then you serve to, to, to feed the goats. And you leave the sheep going, help me, help me. 
love me, care for me. And all that happens when you worry about numbers is you're neglecting the bride of Christ. That is not having the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us, Who has understanding that the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. See, the body of Christ has to have his mind, and we want to make sure that those who are amongst us are of us. That they really are Christian. No, I'm not saying that we should be junior Holy Spirits. But look, our sign says, God expects spiritual fruit. And he does. If you have the mind of Christ, show me your fruit, church. And that doesn't mean just about getting numbers. It means, are, are those who are, that are in the bride, are you loving them? Are you, are you putting fruit together? Are you showing the fruits of repentance? Because just coming to church every Lord's Day, that doesn't show the fruits of repentance. Now, that, you obviously, to have the mind of Christ, if God is in you, the Holy Spirit is indwelling in you, he will draw you to his people. You will want to be together with like-minded people. You'll want to feel the love of Christ. How do we feel the love of Christ, church? By being in the midst of the body of Christ. See, a, a healthy church strives to grow inwardly. See, and that's how we can tell that, that, we're, that we're united in the mind of Christ is when we strive to grow inwardly. That's where it's got to start with. You know, a lot of times churches are now looking for church growth movements and we need to do all this other stuff and we need to draw people in and draw people in and that's true and we're going to talk about that. But first off, we've got to focus on what it actually means to have the mind of Christ. And it means that you've got to look to the interest of others, not just other goats that you may not know are actually the blood-bought bride of Christ that are going to repent of their sins, but you've got to look to those who you know are or that you feel might be. And you can only do that when you're interacting with each other. When you're doing life together, church. So when I'm saying inwardly, I'm not talking inwardly in such a way, it's, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me. We are to grow inwardly. Brother, what is going on in your life? Can I be a part of your life? Can I serve you? Sister, can I serve you? How can I love you? Do you need your grass mowed? Do you just need somebody to care for and talk to? Do you need a shoulder to cry on? Do you need help with your homework? Don't ask me if you do. Church, we are to look inwardly at each other, not inwardly in such a way that it's about me, but inwardly to the body of Christ. How can we serve one another, care for one another? See, because a church that's united by the mind of Christ is a healthier church, and they strive to grow inwardly. Some of the ways that we do that is gathering together. Some of the ways that we do that is serving one another. Some of the ways that we do that is gathering together for Bible study. How are you going to grow if you're staying at home? Oh, but pastor, I can read my Bible at home. Oh, yep, you can. It's all about you. No, God has gifted each and every one of you. God has given me gifts that I'm to be poured out upon you. He has given you gifts that we need to hear you. God has, every single believer, he has given a gift to that is used to build up the body of Christ. So as we come together in Bible studies, your spiritual gifts may be for the sister over there. It may just be being in your presence. There may be something that God is doing in you that you don't even recognize. Just you being involved in their lives. Because who you are, if the Holy Spirit of God indwells in you, there are things that are oozing out of you. You are a beacon of light in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So we gather together for Bible study. We gather together to, for things of this nature. But inwardly facing also isn't just Bible study. It's how can we generate ministry? How can we get outside these four walls? 
That's what a healthy church does. That's what a church that's united by the mind of Christ does. We don't even don't only look to strengthen ourselves as the uh, as the church, but we know that there's still the church out there. That's why I've said, church, that my goal as your pastor is to reach every single person in that community. If it would be the will of the Lord to close this church that's been here for 160 years and move us, that, that the, the unbelievers down there would say, come back, church, come back. We want you. We need you. The unbelievers. Think about that. That's what the mind of Christ is. That's what it means to be having the mind of Christ. We look to serve the unbeliever. Because you don't know. Christ may have bore the sins, bore their sins on the cross. That could be your brother and sister. You don't know that. But when we're so inwardly facing that we don't want to go outside the walls, we're not being the church. We're just coming to the club. See, because we strive to have a healthy church, because we strive to be united in the mind of Christ, we seek to be a healthy church that strives to grow outside, to grow outreach. What is it in your heart? What are the things that you enjoy to doing? Let's put that together in some kind of a ministry opportunity. Because you're just not the only person that has these needs and these wants and these desires. My desire is to have a family. That's why I'm, I strive for church unity. Come together, join in fellowship. This ideology that we can be united and being in the same household but not be together, that's hogwash. That's not true. You think you're together when one of you is over here in this room and one of you is over here in this room and one of you is over here. No, we are to be united to do life together. Those who have the mind of Christ have one Priority. Magnify and glorify God. It's not, I want to go race first. It's not, I want to go to camp first. It's not, I want to go golfing first. No. It's, I want to serve Christ. He's my priority. I want to serve the church. So we strive to find outreach opportunities. To draw people to us. See, we stand united in the mind of Christ when we do these things. So we've looked at the whole idea that because we strive to be a healthy church, a healthy church is united because a healthy church strives to have the mind of Christ. And then a healthy church strives for all members to be in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means to be a blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. Why? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. From the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. But the mind that is set on the spirit is peace and joy and love. So brothers and sisters, to have the mind of Christ, we also see that we have a healthy church that strives to grow inwardly and a healthy church that strives to grow in outreach. But how can we stand united in the mind of Christ? Well, we simply follow his lead. See, because we are united. See, because we strive to follow Christ's example. Look with me in verses 8. He says, In being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see what Paul's doing here? He's actually giving us the idea from verses 1 through 5, saying, have this mind, have this mind, have this mind. And then he does what? He points to Jesus who was in the very nature of God. 
the exact imprint of God. Not just the image of God as the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you. No, he's in the nature of God. He is God. He came and left his heavenly realm where, he, where all of his glory is manifested in everything. Behold, the, the sky proclaims the glory of God. Right? All things proclaim the glory of God. Paul uses that for an example. This is everything that you do in your life. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. Look to Christ as your example. He is your example. See, we stand united with the mind of Christ when we strive to follow Christ. Can we really do that when we just want to stay at home in our own rooms, looking so inwardly at ourselves that we can't suit the needs of the brothers and sisters? Is that following Jesus? Is it following Jesus when we won't share the gospel with people? We won't go out of our realm of comfort? No. It's not. To follow in Jesus' footsteps, as you can see, he, took, he, 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 he brought a new nature onto himself. He, 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 being God, humbled himself. And look how the words connect to being humble. He says that, that looking up in verse 3, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Do you, are you so prideful that, that you don't count others more significant than yourselves, but the king of the universe can humble himself? He can humble himself and take upon the flesh, measly, sinful flesh, being born in the likeness of flesh? And you mean to tell me you can't help your brother or sister? If you are that way, shame on you. Repent. And follow the example of Christ. If you have no desire to follow the example of Christ, and everything that I'm saying to you is going one ear and out the other, I'm telling you there's a good chance you might not be a Christian. You may just be a part of the club. Those who have the mind of Christ Live as if they have the mind of Christ. They follow in his footprints. Look all through scripture. All through scripture. What, what do the Christians say? The Christian leaders, the pastors, the apostle Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That's what each and every one of you should be doing. Everybody that you're in contact with, be an imitator of me as I am of Christ. Fathers, do you... Illustrate that to your children. Do you illustrate that to your wife? Wives, do you illustrate that to your husbands? We are to have the mind of Christ and follow in Christ's footsteps. He humbled himself. See, because we strive to follow in Christ's example, Christ's followers strive to be humble. We seek to serve one another. To put others' interests first. How can I serve you, brothers and sisters? How can I help you? That's what each and every one of us should be thinking like. And whether people realize this or not, we're seeing this right now in today's day and age. As we think about the law enforcement officers that are putting themselves in harm's way. Those who are believers in Christ are imitating Christ. They're looking to serve the body of Christ, putting themselves in harm's way, just as Christ did. He put himself in harm's way to such a point that people rebelled against him and hung him on a tree. Don't you want to be united? Don't you want to have that sense of worth? Paul says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. To live as if you are citizens of heaven. See, those who strive to follow in Christ's example, that are united in the mind of Christ, 
They strive to be obedient to this. Look at Christ's obedience. And sometimes people say, oh, we've got obedience. No, like, it's all about the gospel. Well, you've got to understand there is a law of gospel distinction. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you should fulfill the law of Christ. You should have the fruits of repentance. Those who set their mind on the things of the flesh. That was Romans 8 that I quoted earlier, by the way. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. There is a law gospel distinction. And if the gospel has been applied to you, if you have taken into the understanding that God took upon flesh, lived the life that you couldn't live, died the death that you deserved, and three days later was risen by his own power, if you believe that, if you've repented of your sins, trusted upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will show fruit of repentance. You will be obedient to having the mind of Christ. That's called sanctification. That God comes into us, that he, he, he gives us new spiritual life, causes us to be born again. And as a result of us being born again, our eyes are opened. We turn and say, oh my goodness, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. That God died for me. That Christ died for me. And you believe the gospel and you repent. And as a result, God justifies you and begins the sanctification process. Sanctification means that you are becoming more and more like Christ. Having the mind of Christ being united with the mind of Christ, and you are sinning less and less. From one degree of glory to the next, you're being transformed into the image of Christ. So that means your mind is being transferred into the image of Christ. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if he has actually made you a member of the body of Christ, then your mind has been changed. And you will seek to be obedient to him. And you will seek to strive to live for the church. This whole idea that, yeah, I love the church. I love Jesus. And I would go to the church if you could just get all them hypocrites out of there. There's always room for one more. We all know this saying, right? See, God sanctifies us through the gifts of the brothers and sisters. As you come together, Sanctification happens because of the gifts that this sister has that's implied into your life, or this brother has that's implied into your life. God uses that. That's how we grow. I mean, the apostles gather together daily to break bread and hear from the apostles' teaching. See, we stand united in the mind of Christ because we strive to follow Christ's example. Brothers and sisters, stand united with Christ's mind. I'm going to give you four points of applications in closing. First thing, go outside the realm of your comfort zone and seek ways to serve the body. If you're somebody that doesn't like to read, stretch yourself like Brother Gary has grateful for Gary's expectation and eagerness to live by an example. Going outside of the realm of his comfort. Getting in front of everybody. But you might say, I don't want to get in front of everybody. Uh, no, 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 I can't do that. Go outside of the realm of your comfort. You're teaching others to get into areas where you may not be able to do. Well, maybe others will help your sanctification process. What are you ashamed of in front of your own family? See, if everybody here is united together, if everybody's striving for the mind of Christ, there's no, there's no showboating. There's nothing outside. I mean, you, we, you should look at us men like these are all your children or your fathers or your brothers or your sisters. Do you ever, are you ever scared to get in front of your brothers and sisters and say, hey, bro, what's up? No. Don't do that in the household of God. Go outside of your realm of comfort. Seek ways to serve the body of Christ. Put the needs and the concerns of others above yourselves. That, that in and of itself might be outside of the realm of comfort. Some of us have been raised in such a way that we're introverts. 
And just to even get around people, we start to get anxieties kicking in. And, you know, especially with the coronavirus, you know, stay six foot away. Here's my pool. Leave me alone. Kind of ordeal. You, you, you know what I mean? And we have this, and I understand that. But still, seek the concerns of others above yourselves. Are there people in the church that don't have a life and need one? I mean, we... We, we hear that kind of terminology in a slanderous way. Get a life! Well, maybe you're just a person they need to give them that life. Maybe you, you have the message of hope. You have all that they need for eternal salvation. What, what has been the reoccurring motif of this, of this book? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. I mean, all of chapter 1. Paul's in prison. He says, for some preach Christ from envy and robbery, and others preach him out of goodwill. And in all this I rejoice, because Christ is being proclaimed. Brothers and sisters, those who don't have a life and need one, need you, who have the message of eternal life. Point two. Go outside of your comfort zone and start up a gospel conversation with somebody. Now, some of you might be, oh, I do that all the time. Everywhere I go, I'm trying to preach the gospel. And praise God for you because of the fact that that tells me you have maybe a gift of evangelism. You know? That, that everywhere you go, you want to have gospel conversations. You want to tell people about Jesus. But not everybody feels that way. If you want to and you're not sure how to go, well, that's where coming together with people that can explain that. You know, if you want to share the gospel and you're concerned about the proper way to evangelize or the proper way of doing apologetics, come see me, please. That's what our lives should be lived for. Jesus, before he ascended to the right hand of the Father, says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to leave you for the rest of your life to do whatever you want. No, he doesn't say that. Lo and behold, I will be with you. If the Holy Spirit of God is in you, that's, that's your commission, brother and sister. So if you want to do that, share the gospel and you're unsure of it, come see me and I will help you. I will mentor you and teach you. We'll, we'll search the scriptures. Oh, but if you don't have that desire, I say even more, Please come see me. Because if you don't have that desire, you probably don't know God. Because you don't have the mind of Christ then. Those who have the mind of Christ seek to follow his will. And that might even just be in the matter of, you know, walking out to, to get your mail. You know, to share the gospel. Now that's not saying... I want to be careful when I say that. That's not saying that if you're really not comfortable with it and you, you love Jesus, and, but you're just, confrontation isn't your thing and you're afraid to get into confrontation that you're sinning. I'm not saying that. So just let me qualify that. What I am saying is go outside of your comfort zone, little by little, step by step, and start up a gospel conversation with somebody. This may require for you to take some time, write down what you would say, Start out with a, a little, a, a short piece of paper, you know. Jesus Christ lived the life I couldn't live, died the death that I deserve, and three days later was risen that if I would repent of my sins and turn and trust upon him and, and believe in him, that I would have eternal life. Like that's one paragraph, one sentence, just a very long sentence. It might take you writing some time, writing that down. And then extend that to a page of paper. And then maybe a, a, a couple pages. Start to get into the intricacies of the gospel. And again, I can help you with that. If you need, it would be my pure joy to be able to serve you in that manner. Is there somebody who needs discipled that you could help? I'm not big on one-on-one -on -one discipleship outside of the whole body. But your life experiences. God has done a work in you. Use that. Use that to talk to others. Your testimony is powerful. The things that you've went through in life is powerful. Use it. 
Point three, stop making excuses why you're not coming to church Bible studies. Why you're not participating in things. I mean, I could spend a sermon and months just on that topic. That's one of the ways that you're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of of Christ. When we gather together for Bible studies. To neglect that is to neglect the body of Christ. To neglect that, that is actually sinful. Because the Bible commands of us to stir one another up to love and good works. When your pastor is getting things developed to for your spiritual ability, for you to grow in your walk, in your sanctification process, when your pastor is putting things together to help you grow spiritually, spending time by the gifts that God uses to put together teaching lessons, and you say, nah, I'd rather go out and go fishing. That's sin. You can flower it all you want. The Bible commands of you to do it. Now, that's not to say, well, listen, I got, I got work. There, there's, there's reasons for that. That's understandable. My point is not to preach a sermon on why you should be gathering together. But if you have the mind of Christ, that should be your goal. You want a couple verses that would prove that? Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Ephesians 4, 8 through 16. Colossians 3, 16. And Acts 2, 42 through 7. I know some of you are very adamant with looking Bible verses up, and I greatly appreciate that. My final point. Make it a point to try and think and head up the efforts of some kind of outreach event. Some way, some way to draw people in. Think of and try to take the effort to say, let me lead this. I've heard some great stories about, in the past, things that have happened here. I mean, the 16-foot... Uh, uh, what, what was it, a 60-foot b- banana split? Oh, that's awesome. We're doing that. Those are great outreach opportunities. Think of an outreach opportunity and lead up its efforts. See, a healthy church has an every-member ministry. A healthy church, one that has their mind set on Christ, one that's united in, in, in the mind of Christ, Every member has some kind of a ministry. Is there a picnic that needs to be organized? Is there a youth event that needs to be organized? An outside event like a hiking trip or a community work day or a fishing trip? The things that you enjoy to do, turn them into ministry opportunities. There's no reason that those of you that like to go four-wheeler riding, that you can't do that for a ministry opportunity. That you can grow together in, in, in fellowship with one another. That's having the mind of Christ. Those of you that like to go golfing, that's okay, let's have a golf outing. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to stand united in the mind of Christ. And see, because we strive to do that here at Montgomeryville Baptist Church, We're going to strive to be a healthy church because we want to strive to follow Christ as his example. I pray that that would be your goal and that would be your expectations as the body of Christ here. So let's do just that, church. Let us pray.